Today's sermon was written by uh, Linda Ferguson. However, she's experiencing shortness of breath today, so I'm going to read it for her. Let's pray. Risen God, make us your resurrection people. As we draw near to you, send us out into the world as transformed and renewed agents of renewal and of transformation. Amen. Amen. Early that morning, Mary made her way to the gravesite of Jesus. And when she arrived, the stone had been removed. Perhaps she peered inside to see that the body of Jesus was missing, but she didn't enter. She ran and found Peter and another disciple in some unidentified location and told them the alarming news that someone had removed Jesus from the tomb. The two ran to the tomb, and maybe they didn't believe her. Maybe they surmised that the tomb would be a good place to start their search for Jesus. We aren't privy to their thoughts, only their actions. As they moved toward the tomb, the other disciple arrived first at the scene, but didn't enter. Peter couldn't be stopped until he was inside the resting place, set aside for Jesus' remains. And only the linens remained as witness and evidence that Jesus was there and has now shed the vestiges of death. The cloth covering his face was slightly removed from the other wrappings, giving a sense of his moving and shedding as it took those first new steps of life. This morning, in our gospel story, we saw that Mary was facing an eternal life-altering question for which she could not discern any answer at all. The events of the last few days were unbelievable, and they had flung her life into utter chaos. She was living grief beyond belief, questions far beyond any answers she could see. And that morning, all the questions were looming, with no answers anywhere close by. It all started in the dark. John tells us it was the first day of the week, and it was still dark outside. No hint of dawn at all. It was a darkness that covered everything, not just a physical darkness, but also an inability to see and understand the Jesus they followed, hidden by the dark. Dark events of the last few days. <laughs> What could Mary do but return, if only to pick up the pieces of her life and try squinting through the darkness to make some sense out of what was left? She wanted to start there, in the last place she'd seen Jesus, ground zero of whatever life she was going to have to rebuild, all the while desperately wishing for everything just to go back the way it had been before. I don't really blame Mary for returning to the scene, do you? After an exhausting week and the utter dreadfulness of what had happened, perhaps she'd finally collapsed out of exhaustion. And then a few hours later, while it was still dark, her mind started the questions all over again. Stretching her aching body and prying open her red raw eyes, all she could think of was the memory of Friday, the horror of the cross, and the urgent rush to prepare Jesus' body before Sabbath began. She had to go back. She had to go back just in case, just in case there was any way to salvage what was, to put things to rights, to just get things back to normal. Stunned and exhausted, Mary went back to the familiar, back to the Savior she loved and followed. What would the future hold? She didn't know, and she wouldn't even consider it. If only things could return to the way they were. And so she went to the tomb, early that morning in the dark, once she got there, she could see clearly that the foggy recollection of days 
just past were real memories, and that in fact, the nightmare had just gotten worse. All the care and love the women had put into entombing Jesus' body had been upset. The stone moved, the seal of the tomb broken, the grave clothes piled neatly and no body to be found at all. In the Gospel reading, John tells us Mary ran to tell the disciples. This was a serious turn of events, the looting of the grave. And Mary, John tells us, couldn't stop crying. She came back and stood at the open tomb, weeping and all alone, grieving the loss of a savior, and even worse, the loss of everything she knew to be true about her life. And as she stood there weeping, she met a stranger in the garden. <clears throat> this man must be the gardener, she was certain. He looked at her with compassion. He was obviously distraught and asked her why she was crying, how he could help her. If there was someone she had lost, yes, she sobbed. If you have moved this body for some reason, please, please tell me where you have laid him, and I will take his body and care for it. Please help me. Mary, her name. That was all he said, but then she knew. She knew. His voice pierced the foggy, befuddled chaos of her brain. And she looked up in sudden recognition and said, Rabboni. And the moment when Jesus called her name, her whole world shifted. And she knew in an instant, nothing would ever be the same again. And I think for Mary Magdalene, this moment in the garden would have to rank up there in the top of her list. One moment she was in the midst of grief, surrounded by darkness. The next moment she recognized Jesus and the light began to dawn. When Jesus calls Mary by her name, it's right then that she was able to see. And that moment when she encountered the risen Christ for the first time, it changed everything. Her hopes suddenly rose. He's here, he's alive. Everything can get back to the way it used to be. Only to plummet when Jesus said to Mary, it's time to let go. Today, this is our story to tell. Now that we have been called by name and have witnessed the power of God, everything changes. There's not one person whom Jesus encounters in the entire gospel narrative who is not asked to change, and change big. Lay down your nets. Do you want to be healed? Repay those you've stolen from. Get up and walk. And for Mary, it's nothing different. When the living God calls our name, everything changes. Oh, if only everything could stay the same. Everything we believe about God and everything we knew about ourselves. But resurrection is definitely not about <coughs> staying the same. When we're confronted with resurrection, I mean really personally confronted, when the resurrection Christ calls our names, everything changes. For Mary, that meant going and telling. And she's known now by us as the first witness to the resurrection, the one who had the courage to recognize God's work and to share the good news. Yes, the good news of resurrection is that Jesus called Mary by her name and offered her the opportunity to follow the living God. Out of the dark despair of that morning, and into a new and life-giving light. God called her name. God calls our names.
But telling the Ether story once a year as a tradition isn't likely to change anything. Remember, resurrection changes everything. We cannot leave this place today and put the miracle of new life and the promise of resurrection back on the shelf till next year. Why not? Because God is calling our names, every single one of us, just like Mary. We're offered a personal invitation to go and tell, to live our lives with the conviction that the good news of Easter, the overthrow of sin and death, is not a dry and dead ceremony we celebrate once a year. No, this time it's personal. Jesus is calling our names, calling us to live as if the gospel matters, calling us to practice resurrection every single day of our lives. <clears throat> Jesus wouldn't let Mary leave that day without being changed, and Jesus won't let you or me encounter resurrection and leave unchanged either. If Easter means anything at all, we're going to walk out of here determined to practice resurrection. Jesus has called us by name and offered us the opportunity to practice resurrection. Can we hear the resurrection, resurrected Savior calling us by name? Today, the day of resurrection is certainly a day to answer that call. So go and tell Jesus Admonish, tell that Jesus admonishes us as he told Mary that day. Take this resurrection hope out into the world. This is your task this Easter. Know it, because God has called each of us by name. Let us pray. <clears throat> Risen one, come, meet us in the garden of our lives. Lure us into elation. Revive our silent hope. Coax our dormant dreams. Raise up our neglected gratitude. Entice our tired enthusiasm and give life to our faltering relationships. Roll back the stone of our indifference. Unwrap the deadness of our spiritual lives. Risen one, send us forth as disciples of your unwavering love, messengers of your unlimited joy. Resurrected one, may we become ever more convinced that your presence lives on, and on, and on. Amen. Amen.